for you all here. So, <clears throat> okay, so ancillary tools uh, are the things that are beyond the things we've been talking about, APT uh, and ETC. Uh, and the idea with these tools is that there are certain things you can do in APT, but you have to go to a lot of extra overhead to enter observations and things before you get to the diagnostics. If you just want a quick look at visibilities, if you want to get a look into the backgrounds, uh, into the sensitivities of your observations that you're thinking about making, these ancillary tools should allow you to do that upfront, kind of as a quick look way of getting a sense for what is reasonable and what is difficult for uh, JWST. So this is where these ancillary tools uh, come in. So those are basically the three areas that we have uh, generated tools for now, the visibility tools of various kinds, which we'll talk about, uh, the background, uh, background tool that uh, Klaus mentioned already, uh, and then there's a brand new tool that really literally has just been uh, released out there. There's a page on JDocs and the tool itself is now available. That's called the JWST Interactive Sensitivity Tool that basically uh, will give you insight into uh, exposure time, signal to noise that are possible and whatnot based on uh, a pre-calculated grid of point source models with the ETC Pandaya engine that we heard about this morning. Uh, and so I'll, I'll point you to that as we go along. But those are the three areas that uh, uh, we think are going to be most beneficial uh, in the way of these tools. And uh, I put this into this talk because we didn't have another place where it was going to come up. It's really uh, important for you to know whether what you're proposing has already been proposed. Uh, in future cycles, we'll have actual real observations in, the, in MAST, but also the things that have been proposed and accepted uh, for uh, observation. We don't want to duplicate those observations. And it would be a shame if you went through all that ETC, all that APT work, and got to the end and found out that you had a duplication with something that had already been proposed, unless there was a scientific reason for it, like a time variable source or something like that. So there's a way for you to check duplications. And again, I would encourage you and your, your charges to uh, think about that right up front. And we'll talk about that uh, as I go through this talk. Uh, so, uh, so let's go through a few of these things and uh, just give you a little sense for how these things uh, work. And, and actually, to get into the visibility tools, I wanted to just give you a little insight into the res pointing restrictions and the angle restrictions for the observatory uh, itself. Um, <clears throat> here in this figure, uh, we have uh, a, a, in, the, in the kind of purpley area here, is a graphic that shows the field of regard. This is the area of the sky that uh, JWST can see at any one time. And if you think about rotating this around in the sky, it's a big torus on the sky. It goes from 85 degree sun angle to 135. And if you just spin that around on the sky, then you've got a big torus on the sky. That's where JWST can see at any particular time. Okay. Now, of course, JWST is an orbit, you know, is a fixed orbit with the Earth. So that we, as we go around the sun, that torus then sweeps out the entire sky over the course of the year, uh, and uh, uh, everything is visible at some time or another. It's just not visible all at the same time. All right. And so you could imagine if you had a target that was uh, 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 out here, you'd have to wait for there's a big hole in this torus here, so you're not visible when you're over here. And as that sweeps along, you cut through one side or the other of this torus, and you would get two periods of visibility when that torus moves over your target. So just to give you a little, little sense for, for this. So uh, it moves about one degree per day across the, the background sky, of course, and it sweeps out the entire uh, sky over the course of the year. Now. Since the whole sky is visible, if your observations being proposed are just point sources, don't care about the timing, don't care about the position angle, you may never have to use these tools yourself. But if you do care about that stuff, getting insight into what's possible and what's not right up front can be a huge time savings to you. And so that's why we provide these tools. Uh, and for coronography in particular, where you have a lot of angular uh, constraints and whatnot, it's really important to use one of the target visibility tools to give you some insight into that. So. We'll get to that. OK, so here's a couple more graphics. So now we've got JWST here behind its sunshade. The sun's coming from the, the right in this diagram uh, against the sunshade, and the telescope here is on the dark side. OK, and here's the 85 to 135 zone. And again, you can rotate that around 360, so you get your torus there. Uh, that's all fine. But now if we look at it from another direction, 
in terms of the sun now coming from the bottom in this diagram against the sunshade, we have very little flexibility to roll in, in the V2 or in that, in that direction. Okay, or, or sorry, you're rolling around the V1 axis, which is the bore sight of the telescope. And so this constraint, as you look at different parts of the sky, comes into play because there are parts of the sky that you cannot place the field of view of JWST at any arbitrary angle. You get restricted, and where those restrictions happen is as you get down to low ecliptic latitudes uh, on the sky. Ecliptic latitudes on the sky. And we're not used to thinking that much about ecliptic. Uh, latitudes. So here is a, a graph, and right now I've got ecliptic latitude plus and minus on the x-axis here, and on the y-axis it's just telling you the total integrated number of days that you can observe any piece of the sky. And you can see that there's no place on the sky that you can observe less than 100 days, which is really good. A lot of, but if you had angle restrictions in here as well, you have problems. Okay, And, and, and things that are down here in this fishbowl have two observing periods per year, two shorter periods that total up to this 100 days. In this case, you've got 50 days in two different windows. And then as you get up, get up above uh, about 45 degrees, plus or minus ecliptic latitude, then all of a sudden your uh, visibility goes up until you get all the way up to the continuous viewing zones, which there are five degree uh, radius uh, continuous viewing zones around both north and south ecliptic poles. So there is a continuous viewing zone up there. <coughs> Okay, another way of looking at this, so this is, I'm going to step you through this. This, this is a, an interesting graphic, but it has several different purposes. So I'm going to ask you, first of all, to ignore the color scale, and let's just look at the shape of this on the sky, okay? And if we had a target that was an ecliptic, now I've got ecliptic latitude here on the y-axis, and this is the observatory reference angle, this V3 position angle uh, on this axis down here. And so things that are uh, in the wide areas have a wide range of available position angles on the sky and things down here at low ecliptic latitude all of a sudden you see you don't have very much flexibility uh, here in this narrowest part you've probably got maybe 10 degrees plus or minus five degrees of flexibility to place the field of view onto the sky and so it's down here at low ecliptic latitudes that you're going to have a hard time just coming up with a, any arbitrary angle that you would like it's going to be very restricted. And that restriction goes away as you go up. You have these big windows of time, very large range of position angle that is available. So that's one thing to show. So here's the orange line at the top at a, a target at uh, ecliptic latitude 50 degrees. As you, you can kind of think of th putting down a point in this plot and letting the, letting the plot sweep over your point, okay? And so a point at 50 degrees up there is going to have one long period of visibility and then one long period wraps around one long period where it's not visible. You get, and as you can see here that that's a total of over 100, just over 180 degrees of, uh, of visibility for that target. Now, so the color scale here is something else. Uh, this is telling you how long the observatory can stay at a given legal position angle. And you can see that over much of the sky here, you can only stay about 10 days at the same orientation. But, you, but at sometime during a year, you can get any orientation you want. So let's say you're doing a big mosaic uh, with multiple filters, and it's going to take literally days of observations. And you don't have to do them all together, but you only have a 10-day window to get all those observations into it if you want them all at the same angle, is what that blue uh, is saying up there. Okay. Uh, but as you come down to low ecliptic latitude, if you have a legal angle, you can, hit, you can stay there for 50 days. That goes up to 54, 54 days there in this little zone right here. So if you want to stay at the same position angle for a long time, it turns out that low ecliptic latitude is fine so long as you can live with the angle that, that the observatory can give you. So the color scale here is telling you how long you can stay at a given position angle on the sky. And then the overall scale here is just telling you the range of position angles. And I guess I didn't complete my story here. If we come down to this target at 20, you can see it's got two periods of visibility separated by a lot of, a lot of big gaps. But again, the total time that you get at, uh, for a target like that is still at least 100 days. So that's kind of a complicated plot. But uh, I think you know when you stare at that for a while and think about it, I think uh, that may be uh, useful to you. So length of time at a position angle can be important, but only for really long uh, observations. 
Okay, so the target visibility tools. We have this general tool, which is kind of a simple, dumb command line tool, but it does the job. Plots a plot right to your screen, puts a file right out to your screen, or you can save them with various uh, commands that you put on the command line to direct the output various places and whatnot. Uh, and uh, it does the whole kit and caboodle at once. You get all the instruments, you get the V3 position angle, you get the ranges, it shows you the whole thing. I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, there's a moving target flavor of this tool, which is basically the, the general target visibility tool, but it's linked into the Horizons uh, moving target support system as well, so that you can use that tool uh, for moving targets and figure out the windows uh, that work there. And then there's this cor chronographic uh, tool, all of these tools then will spit out the ecliptic coordinates of each target for reference, since that's an important angle uh, for you to at least know about and help you to understand the plots. So this is the general tool. There's a, the simplest form of the command line there is it's just uh, you know shown uh, there. It happens to be for SS Cygni. I just grabbed a cataclysmic variable star there. And default is you get all six of these plots to your screen, or you can send them out to a file. You can restrict it and just get one instrument if you want to. You can All that's done with command line uh, changes here. You see it's saving the plot out to a PNG file and so forth. And you can do the same with the ASCII output file as well. Uh, these are showing you the available position angle as a function of time over several cycles here, several years. Uh, you can see the pattern repeats here. And so ones that have lines that go, go almost vertically like this say that you have a huge range of position angles that you can observe that target, whereas ones like in the example that Shelley showed you in APT is showing you a similar plot to this where it just had little lines that went like this that were just kind of sloped a little bit that had very narrow ranges of available angle. And so that this basically just tells you both when you can observe on uh, this axis and the range of position angles that you have available for each of the instruments, and here's your V3 uh, for reference as well. You can see V3 near CAM near us are very similar to each other and uh, near spec is the one that's going to be quite a bit different in terms of the scales here because of that big offset that we saw uh, of its reference angle. I might just mention also that since we're talking about this, we, we uh, Shelley mentioned uh, the V3 position angle, this reference angle for the observatory and the aperture position angle. Let me just say that um, the aperture position angle uh, is the astronomical position angle of that reference axis on the sky. We're all used to thinking of degrees east of north, north is zero, degrees east of north. And so if you're trying to take a field of view and place it on the sky in a certain way, you might be more interested in the aperture position angle. And that's why we have the switch that can go back and forth between V3 and aperture position angle. That's just the astronomical position angle of that reference axis on the sky. So if you're planning an observation and you want to place a field of view on the sky at a certain angle, aperture position angle is what gives you that, uh, and APT will convert it to V3 position angle interior. But when you're using the diagnostics in APT, it's working in V3 position angle. And so that's why it gets a little bit dicey with these different angles. And uh, we apologize for that. It's just complicated. Uh, again, some of these instrument, instruments are almost exactly on V3 within a fraction of a degree, and so it doesn't really matter too much to you. But some of the other ones, uh, the offset is a little bit larger, and that's why you'll see those, those differences. Okay. Okay. The ASCII part of this general tool just looks like this. It's uh, it basically has a, a header uh, on the file. Uh, it does give you the ecliptic latitude of your target there for reference. SS Cygni is at 52 degrees, so we have one long observing period. It gives you a summary for the time frame that you ran it for. You can actually restrict the time range to to uh, a, a smaller range here. It just ran for the entire. Uh, range uh, of several years, uh, and it gives you the start and end of the visibility window. It's duration. Here you see 200 days, uh, and the start and end time, and our index uh, just gets copied forward. And then below that, it shows you day by day for several years. In this case, that's a big, long ASCII file. Again, you can restrict that if you want to, but it gives you, for each of those six things, V3, near cam, and so forth, the minimum and maximum angle that you can get on every day. So, I mean, it gives you probably more information than you really need, but uh, uh, that's what it does. So, okay, the chronograph chronographic visibility tool uh, does 
The first order does the same thing. The visibility plot that it gives you here in the, in the left-hand panel is basically the same thing we've been looking at, right? This is uh, the degrees for the uh, angle that you can get and the day of the year here. Okay, so this is basically just the solar angle and the 85 to 135 is the part that it shows in red. So there's your visibility window. And then what it's showing you in the blue is the angle, the reference angle for whatever setup that you've selected for the coronagraphic, either near mirror or near cam. Uh, and it gives you uh, the angles available for that instrument and that cor coronagraph. There's several different coronagraphs in the different uh, instruments and so forth. Okay. And it's the same thing. You basically, uh, it's got some nice features. I mean, you can use this for your general visibility. If, if you just want to use that part of the plot, you can come in here and type a target name in the box and it goes and finds the coordinate for you. It's more like APT in that regard. Uh, does spit back your ecliptic coordinate for you if you want it. Uh, and uh, so the simple, Simple part of this is just like uh, general visibilities, uh, except it's basically telling you for MIRI and, uh, and NIRCAM uh, what's going on, because it's really geared for this next part that I'll tell you about, which is the coronagraphic uh, part of it. So uh, once you've got your target loaded up here, you come down and say, uh, you, you pick your instrument and your uh, coronagraph uh, and uh, update the plot, and that's when you get uh, a new plot out over here. Um, and this is just a, this is a matplotlib uh, interface thing. So you just got your kind of normal matplotlib uh, plot controls down here. You can zoom in uh, and save the file and so forth and so on <coughs> down here on the bottom. That's all documented in JDocs. <coughs> okay, so here's one where I've now started to use the coronagraphic uh, part of this interface. Uh, I've just added a single companion. You can add up to three companion stars in this tool, or three companions, I should say, because you're probably looking at planets or something like that around a bright star. Uh, in this case, I've just entered one there so you can see what's going on. Uh, and as it plots out the track versus time for your visibility window, and I've zoomed in here a little bit so you can see what's going on, it also then provides a track from your star that's occulted to the companions as a function of time as this arc around the outside. Okay. Uh, a neat thing about these plots is you can come in and click in one plot and it shows you where you are in the other plot. So in this particular case for the Leo spectrograph in Miri, you would not want to observe your planetary companion when it was in that position unless you were trying to occult the, the uh, companion star. So you can use this to find times you should not observe it. All right, And you click there uh, on that point and all of a sudden it shows you where you are over here both in time and in the angle on the sky. And for coronography, a lot of times you want to observe at multiple angles to uh, smear out your PSF and, and do a better job of the subtraction uh, on that case. So, uh, or you could then come out and click and find, you know, if you wanted to get the furthest away from the, from the uh, occulting bar, you'd want to pick a time over here with some range or something like that. And again, it would show you over here uh, where you are. And uh, although it's not real obvious in this zoomed in plot, the vertical extent of this tells you that whether you've got plus or minus five or plus or minus three and a half or plus or minus seven degrees uh, as a function of when you observe your target uh, around uh, the solar elongation uh, range. So lots of information uh, in there. The zoom control is down there on the bottom. Okay, this is also a trick if you've got disk systems like beta, or this is AU uh, microscopy uh, up here in the corner. Uh, and again, you wouldn't want to have your Leo axis accidentally laying right along that disk. You would actually kind of want to get it perpendicular to that. So if you want to see what the disk angle is, I've just played a game here where I've put in uh, two objects at the same position angle, but I've put one on one side and one on the other side at a slightly different value so the curves don't overlap there. But basically, by clicking over here, you can see you know, what angle the disk would have and then when to observe it over here. So you can just kind of trick it a little bit and, and do disk stuff uh, as well. Okay, are we ready for backgrounds? This won't take too much longer. I know we're getting ready for a break. I know I'm ready for a break. Okay. Uh, Klaus talked a little bit about uh, backgrounds, which is fine. I'm really not going to uh, go into too much more detail. You saw this plot uh, earlier, lots of different components to the background as a function of wavelength. And in particular out here at longer wavelengths, the thermal uh, uh, emission from the telescope actually is the dominant uh, source. 
Uh, that may change a little bit with position and, and you know, thermal conditions on the satellite, but uh, we don't have perfect modeling of that uh, pre-mission, obviously. Uh, the other big component that's variable is the, is the zodiacal light, the green curve here. Uh, and uh, this is just showing you one line here, but that does vary with time of year and with position uh, on the sky. And so that's what the uh, backgrounds tool uh, is going to try to provide you some information uh, on uh, as well. Uh, now, if you've got bright stellar sources, uh, probably don't have to worry about background very much. But if you have, if you're pushing the limit, getting down to the faint stuff and whatnot, and get into this background limited regime, it's going to affect your ETC calculations. It's going to affect your signal to noise expectations and whatnot. And so the background uh, becomes more important. Uh, and from a schedulability standpoint, it also affects. Uh, the window of opportunity for you to observe. It gets shorter because you're restricting uh, it based on the background level as a function of time. And so again, uh, Klaus showed a uh, curve similar to this. This is, this is uh, two outputs from the background tool. Uh, this is at two microns, uh, and this is at four and a half microns, and it's for uh, two different, uh, or it's for the goods south field, so this is a deep field thing. Uh, you can see the minimum expected background level is the one green line here in both, both plots. And what's been assumed here, I think it says threshold 1.1. That means it's assuming that you're trying to stay 10% within 10% of the lowest background that you can get. And so that's this line. And so instead of your full visibility window being like this, now you're restricted down to a smaller window. I guess I showed it better over here. Instead of having that full visibility window, you're restricted because you've called for low background on that observation. It's not terribly restrictive. You can see it's still got a good 50, 60 days of visibility there. But if you are concerned about the background, you have to put a special requirement in APT that says, I want the low background scheduling. And it automatically then will restrict your window down to this lower value. If you want to restrict it some, but not that much, you can actually set this level to be 20% or 40% uh, of the background, and you're not cutting as much out of your visibility uh, window there. So if you have some angle restriction or something you're working with as well, you can play off those two uh, against each other a little bit. But the backgrounds tool allows you to at least assess uh, what happens to you as a function of uh, the level that you allow uh, for scheduling. OK. so. Uh, this now is going to be the GIST tool, this new tool that uh, uh, Klaus and Brian York have just uh, come up with here. Uh, that is a, a quick look version. Uh, it's not a full up ETC, and we don't want to bill it that way. But again, if you want to just get some sense for what's possible, this is very quick and easy to use. Uh, and uh, will really save you a lot of time just in terms of scoping out your proposals ahead of time. Uh, so it's a, a tool that allows you to play with your flux levels, play with your flux density levels, I should say, uh, and uh, assume exposure time. It doesn't give you all the details of the groups and all that stuff. You're just playing with the time, okay? And it gives you some sense for what kind of signal to noise you can get for all the different I instruments, okay? And it works just right in your browser uh, window. Uh, it does make a number of simplifying assumptions. For instance, the grid that is behind this thing is a grid of Pandaya. ETC models that have been calculated, but they were calculated for point sources. So if you're talking about an extended source, well, you can get a quick look with this, but it's not going to give you anything nearly as accurate. Uh, there are other assumptions uh, at the bottom of the page. It's got some of the other assumptions uh, involved there. This is just right out of the tool, so you can see this later. I won't go through that detail. Uh, but uh, uh, it does give you a really easy way to look at uh, feasibility uh, of your observing. And so this is uh, an example where uh, Here's your range of instruments and, and modes that you can select here. So we just, by default, I took the, so, the short wavelength imaging mode uh, of NearCam. Each of these dots is a different filter coded over here. You can also hover over any of those dots with your cursor, and it will pop up exactly uh, what the filter is, just to make sure some of those colors are red or pretty similar, for instance, and whatnot. Uh, and, uh, uh, and what you can do then is you can play with, uh, I've selected AB magnitudes up here, or you can log flux density in Microjanskis up uh, is the selection that you can make up there. And you can just take that slider bar and watch these points go up and down. And as you start to hit saturation, those points just start to disappear. 
Okay, so you get some sense for where you're going to saturate even. Uh, you can then play with your exposure time uh, independent of that and try to get your signal to noise where you want it for a particular filter. Okay, so for imaging, again, you can select MIRI, nearest, any, anything out of that list. I think I have one more example here for spectroscopy just to kind of give you a sense for, uh, for the spectroscopy there. Uh, and again, we've done fixed slit spectroscopy now. And again, the slider bar is up here, and you can see how your signal to noise changes depending on your grading selection over on the side. So that's a brand new tool that's just out there now, and I think people are going to find that and, and help us advertise that because since it is so new out there, a lot of people are not uh, familiar with the fact that it's out there. Uh, it will be updated probably one more time before uh, cycle one hits. So if you see some differences in details of the user interface or something like that, it's because we're still tweaking. But it's basically usable now. It's out there uh, and available, and there's a JDocs article that supports that, uh, that tool as well. And so uh, it, it is so new. This tool is so so new that probably your people that, that uh, have organized your level two sessions may not even have had time to play with this themselves. You might look for an opportunity in your level two sessions to kind of go in and play with this tool and kind of say, where, you know, where are we in parameter space in this example that we're doing here? Can I do something that's 10 times brighter, 10 times fainter? Uh, and you can just kind of come in and play around with this tool and get familiar with it because I think a lot of people will find this useful, again, up front in this kind of quick look, scoping out what's possible phase of your uh, proposal preparation. Okay, a few words about duplications and then we're out to coffee. <clears throat> uh, so there is a policy all of that it goes into gory detail about uh, uh, what is considered a duplication. That article is, is still uh, being revised right now, and uh, it's, so it's not out there right now, but it will be before cycle one, So just so you know. Uh, but it's just in sort of a general sense, uh, targets are not protected. Observations of targets are protected, and by that we mean uh, similar instruments, same mode or template, within some defined factor, an exposure time or signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, similar spectral modes and so forth. You can kind of you kind of know what a duplication is or not, but uh, but basically, uh, to first order, you want to look at what has been proposed in ERS and GTO programs and make sure that you're not accidentally uh, duplicating any of those things. And I'll tell you a little bit about how to do that. Um, there are some some complications, of course, things like the MSA footprint, where you don't even know exactly which targets are going to end up in shutters and which are going to be observed. Well, then you have to kind of identify a potential duplication. Well, I'm looking at the same field. I don't know if I'm looking at the same targets or not, because we don't know exactly what targets they're going to observe. But this is the science I want to do here. If the science is di different enough, that observation could still be doable. Although, if there were actual targets in conflict when push comes to shove, when we actually schedule things, we may have to uh, limit uh, access to some of the previously uh, accessed targets or something like that. But anyway, that's a, that's a subtlety. Most people don't have to deal with that. Basically, you want to check and make sure you're not proposing something that duplicates uh, what's already uh, in the system. OK, so there are reasons that you would want to reobserve something. Obviously, time variable phenomena is one of the, uh, one of the obvious ones, uh, AGNs that vary or whatever. Uh, type thing. So uh, they're not strictly disallowed, but you have to justify it if you're observing something that somebody's observed before. And time variability is certainly one of the, one of the things that would be justified. Um, to assess whether you've got uh, an overlap or not, uh, we don't have any real observations now, but we do have the accepted observations, which are GTO, uh, guaranteed time observ observations from the instrument teams and the early release science programs. Uh, and so uh, the process that we have in place right now to do this is not the smoothest thing that you would like, but it's still not too terribly cumbersome. And it goes kind of like this. You go to MAST, to the discovery portal. Uh, and uh, as a first step, you just enter your target name and a cord let's say a search radius around that. Uh, and uh, if nothing comes up, you're good to go, right? Now, actually, MAST will give you previous Hubble observations and all kinds of stuff. So you might actually learn what's available in other instrumentation by, by doing this as well. But you obviously want to look at JWST and see if anything from GTO or ERS pops up there. So it could be that simple. If you get there and no observations of your target, you're good to go, and your duplication check is done.
if you find out that there is a potential duplication, and that's all you will find out by looking at MAST, because MAST doesn't carry everything forward from APT. Once your observation is in MAST and has been observed, it has all the information it needs to display all the details. But right now, we don't have an interface between APT and MAST that says this is what's planned, because that could change. And so uh, all we can do is look against the uh, submitted or the accepted programs. And so if you uh, think you have a potential duplication uh, with that target, and let's say at least the same instrument, it'll tell you which instrument and which mode, but not the details of the exposures, then what you have to do is go to uh, a second step here where you take the program ID for the program with the possible duplication from MAST, and you come to this tool, and it tells you uh, uh, it sends you right to the APT file. You can download the APT file. Now, you can do that from within APT as well if you want to, but you can actually get the actual APT files for the program that has the potential duplication, and you literally have to open it up and look at it and decide whether you're trying to do something that they were proposing to do. So it's, it, that's the cumbersome part. If you have to go that far, it is cumbersome. We apologize, but that's just kind of the way it is here for this first cycle especially. Uh, in terms of checking for duplications.